good morning, good wet morning. And in opening, since I managed to forget this at the last time, I particularly want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to, their, to the elders past and present. The minister, where's the minister? He's here, there he is. Um, up the front, up the front, so he does what he's told. He's a great minister. Well, more than that, I do what I to I'm told too. And the minister's just been reminding me that these breakfasts have impact. For those of you, and there's many of you who come to most of the breakfasts, you'll remember the start of the year we had Nick Kay speaking to us about the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship. And of course, recently, the state government has announced the Sydney School of Entrepreneurship which actually involves all the New South Wales universities and the TAFE and is started with a grant of $25 million from the state government. And it's our minister who heard the seminar, decided it would be a good thing for the state to have one, and we're having one. And I think it's going to be just fantastic. So thank you for coming along. Thank you for showing your enthusiasm for it. So that's a great initiative. Thank you, minister. So we see where we go with other things. And this morning... Um, I'm really thrilled. This is a spe very special breakfast this morning too because once a year we have the uh, breakfast seminar given by the scientists of the year from the former year. And of course Scott Sloan, Professor, Laureate Professor Scott Sloan from the University of Newcastle was the 2015 New South Wales Scientist of the Year. And ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a riveting talk about geostructure uh, geo failure. But... That itself will be exciting, but you should often think of Scott, not just when you're listening to him. When you drive over the coastal highways of New South Wales, the new Ballina Bypass, don't just think of what the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer did saving the koala. Think of the quality of the roads on those soft soils. When you go through the new tunnels in Sydney, when you ride in the London Underground, when you go on a railway in Italy, when you drive in Boston and Chicago, think of Scott and think of his wonderful um, team of, what is it, 180 people in the Centre of Excellence of Geotechnical Science and Engineering headquartered at the University of Newcastle. Geotechnical engineering, and particularly as formulated with that group and the, the tools and the techniques for understanding soils, earth structures, and how we might build infrastructure around, on those, it has been massively improved around the world by Scott. Scott's been a leader, much decorated for what he's done, and we are, as a state that is going through a lot of infrastructure, going to have more, the longest urban tunnels in the world, we are very lucky to have Scott and the Centre of Excellence here. In particular, um, his work has brought a, a formality of algorithms and structures to what in many ways was a, a partly exact science and partly a rule of thumb, and now we know a lot more and have the tools to do big computer structure analysis. Scott um, originally went to Monash University, uh, did his PhD at Cambridge, worked at Cambridge and Oxford before returning to Newcastle to build up this wonderful group. He's been, as I've mentioned before in other talks, um, his work has been recognised with a very large number of prizes and he probably has more... I think he and Hugh Darrant White fight it out for the greatest number of post-nominals. He's FRS, FRN, FAA, FTSE, before we start all the lesser things, so all the grand academies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Scott Sloan. OK, thank you very much, Mary. With an introduction like that, I think I might stop while I'm ahead. Um, I've given talks in many different places, but I've never given one in a dining room at 8 o'clock in the morning, so uh, it's, a, it's a double first <laughs> in Parliament House, yes. Um, today we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk about failure analysis of geostructures, and uh, a lot of this work, or most of this work, has taken place in the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Geotechnical Science and Engineering, uh, which Mary mentioned is centred at the University of Newcastle. I've, uh, on writing instructions from Mary's office, I've uh, deliberately tried to keep it non-technical. I've, uh, I've got it down to two equations and not a lot of maths. Sorry to disappoint the engineers, but I'm trying to make it uh, uh, digestible to a general audience. Uh, the format of the talk is in three parts. The first part is going to give a little bit of a summary of the activities of the uh, Centre of Excellence, which is 
I'll just call the CGSE, since uh, a lot of the work that goes on there is related to a failure analysis of uh, geostructures. Uh, the second part will describe a method that I developed and has been very widely used. Mary was making some references uh, to that for performing predicting the failure loads of geostructures, and part three will uh, describe some very interesting new research that we've been doing on modelling rockfall uh, uh, effects on mining and transport infrastructure, a difficult problem. OK, part one, um, the purpose of the centre was to uh, pioneer new scientific approaches for the design of Australia's energy and transport infrastructure, uh, leading to more cost-effective design methods for a wide range of infrastructure, such as that shown there. We note there's some very major expenditure underway. Even with the downturn, we're still in line to spend about $250 billion over a five-year window uh, on energy and transport infrastructure. Here are some examples there. And I see uh, in the news yesterday, Minister, that uh, West Connex might get even bigger. Um, we note that uh, Australia's uh, oil and gas industry is worth around $25 billion a year. Uh, we're very active in that space. Uh, and we also note there's a very strong community push which is re reflecting in government attitudes to upgrade Australia's road and rail infrastructure. Uh, and as Mary uh, intimated, that geotechnical engineering plays a pivotal part in that. It's often called the invisible engineering because you actually never see it, but everything that is built is usually related to the ground or sits on the ground. Uh, we note that a lot of our onshore and offshore infrastructures are increasingly being built on soft soils. These are very problematic, difficult to build on uh, and hard to avoid uh, cheap solutions. By way of background, the centre started uh, its operation at the end of 2011, will run for seven years and has a budget of around $25 million. And somewhat surprisingly, it's the only centre of its kind in Australia that's focusing on infrastructure, which I find surprising when you consider how important it is. OK, the motivation. Uh, here are some example failures. There are plenty of others. This is a bit of an embarrassment for the geotechnical profession, but they do occur, and they occur all too frequently. Uh, we do our best, but this is a road cutting failure behind Wollongong, occurred after heavy rain, very large scale slope movement, as you can see, massive damage to this roadway, several million to rebuild and stabilise. Uh, the Yalorn open cut coal mine collapse, which is a celebrated failure and a failure in the geotechnical engineering space. Six million cubic metres of material flowed in here. Uh, that cut was 80 metres high, it was 500 metres long and it was so large it went 150 metres back from the crest and diverted the Latrobe River into the mine causing its uh, partial uh, closure. $200 million cost, 20% loss of Victoria's power supply while that mine was um, uh, partially... 20% uh, loss of Victoria's power supply while that mine was, was partially closed. A jack-up rig failure, these are offshore oil platforms uh, off the coast of Kuwait. Uh, this is a what's called a foundation punch-through or what we call in geotechnics a creme brulee failure where one of the legs has punched through a stiff crust into the soft layer underneath. The thing started to tilt. Uh, once they start to tilt, you're on a hiding to nothing. Eventually, the thing tilted so far that it sank. $350 million for that, and we're still getting at least one of these punch-through failures um, uh, per year. So clearly uh, there's more to do in geotechnics and particularly in, in uh, looking at failure. The core goals of our centre are four of them. One, to provide a national focus for re uh, geotechnical research. Since uh, Mary had her numbers, we're growing a bit, Mary. We're up to 220 now. Um, we're looking at optimising the design of critical infrastructure um, by developing new design procedures and the key here, is, key here is to make safer and more cost effective designs. There's always a challenge to make our, our taxpayer dollar go further. Collaborating with industry, we actively uh, promote the transfer of our work uh, into practice uh, and indeed 31% of our income last year was from industry and non-ARC bodies and we also want to make the centre sustainable post-ARC support. And last but not least, we're aiming to educate and train the next generation of geotechnical engineers. A bit of a, bit of a summary of the centre, four, four main themes. Uh, this first one is <coughs> geomaterial science. So this is where we're looking at the fundamental behaviour of geomaterials with a focus on soft, a focus on soft soils. So we're looking at the structure. How does the microstructure affect the mechanical behaviour? We're looking at things like anisotropy. That means that they've got different uh, properties in different directions. Creep, 
this is a, a common problem in uh, road infrastructure and rail infrastructure where things continue to settle even though the load uh, has ceased to grow. Liquefaction, this is where a soil uh, ceases to behave as a solid and actually starts to behave as a fluid due to a pressure build-up in the soil skeleton which causes loss of friction and the thing begins to flow. And cyclic loading, of course, that occurs in most of our rail and road infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, Multi-physics modelling, um, big name. This is basically where we have multiple processes or several processes occurring at once uh, and they may have different time and length scales. So they have different governing equations and it makes the solution of these problems difficult. So we have multi-phase and multi-scale models. An example would be thermo-hydromechanical modelling if you were trying to store radio uh, uh, nuclear radioactive waste, or if you're trying to do geothermal uh, extraction. Granular hydrodynamics, for instance, if you had scour around a bridge pier where you've got a change in properties from behaving as a solid to a fluid, that's a multi-physics problem as well. Also, pavement analysis can be viewed as a multi-physics problem. We've actually looked at this. Moving boundary value problems. Most times, engineers design things. We don't want them to move very far. Uh, it's bad news if they do, but... A lot of problems in geotechnics, we actually have to allow for ultra-large deformations, very large movements. And examples are anchors for offshore oil and gas, uh, pipelines on the seabed. Uh, quite often we have to divine, design these pipelines so that they can move uh, one, two, three, four, five metres during their design life cycle due to the effects of seabed currents and ocean waves. And we also uh, design penetrometers. These are devices that we insert into the ground and we use those to backfigure the soil properties. Unlike structural engineers, geotechnical engineers have to try and measure what's out there. We don't have the choice of choosing our material. We have to work with what we've got and that's a big problem for us determining exactly what is down there. Also, pile foundations, we're now in the situation where we can model a pile as it is um, um, hammered into the ground over the complete cycle to get more effective design measures. And last but not least, the field of georisk. This is a very growing area where we're going away from a deterministic model. We're looking at stochastic models of analysis. We're doing stochastic models of site characterization where we're looking at things, say, the probability of a strength might be this rather than the strength is this. Uh, focus, big focus on geohazards and estimating the risk of failure. That's what uh, a lot of infrastructure bodies need to know, and also the uh, impact of potential failure on infrastructure. So those four streams, we've got computational modelling over here, a lot of very uh, heavy uh, computer work, and a lot of it is bespoke, so, <coughs> bespoke, so we're not using off the shelf. Physical modelling in centrifuges, I'll say a little bit about that. Also laboratory and field testing. Um, they're feeding into the development of new tools, looking at engineering applications and coming up with better design procedures for much of our energy and transport infrastructure. Here's a, a graphic of the centre, three nodes, uh, the lead node at Newcastle uh, with uh, worldwide expert, world-recognised expertise in computational modelling, soft soils, unsaturated soils and rock mechanics. Unsaturated soils are complex to model there, so it's where you have not only the soil grains but also water and also air. We also have some very sophisticated gear for doing in-situ testing out in the field to determine soil properties. COFs at UWA, um, they focus a lot on offshore geotechnics and pipelines and they also have some of the world's best physical modelling um, uh, systems and these are actually centrifuges. So there's a picture of a centrifuge, much bigger than the centrifuge that you typically get in something like a, a, a biological sciences lab. What you do is build a reduced scale model in one of those centrifuges, then spin it up under a certain g-force, and the scaling laws of mechanics tell you that you can then scale those results up to a prototype where the length scale is equal to the g's that you do the test at, and that's a, a centrifuge in action. And the third node is the Geotechnics and Railway Engineering Centre at Wollongong. It's just got a lot of expertise in railway ge geotechnics and ground improvement. So when we configured this centre, we wanted three uh, groups that uh, could uh, have all the requisite skills to tackle the key issues in energy and transport infrastructure and have a system where, or a, a, a centre where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Okay, our centre is not particularly big. We have 11 
um, CIs, four at, uh, six at Newcastle, four at UWA, one at Wollongong. We also have two very eminent partner investigators, Professor Harry Poulos, who's very well known uh, worldwide. He's probably one of the world's most eminent geotechnical engineers. And Professor Vaughan Griffiths from the Colorado School of Mines. He's an expert in geo-risk. As I said, a small team, but fairly high-powered. Um, two fellows of the Royal Society, three fellows of the Royal Academy of Engineering, four fellows of the Academy of... Ta uh, of, of science and seven fellows of the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering and an Australian Laureate Fellow and a Future Fellow. At Newcastle, where our team is complemented by uh, uh, eight other staff, one of them being a conjoint, Professor Richard Kelly, who's a technical director with a very large engineering uh, consulting firm, SMEC. And these people have a wide range of expertise covering all the key things that we need to do in geotechnics, going from engineering geology through to mining, rockfall, which I'm going to cover later, uh, geo risk, estimating, estimating risk, pipelines, hydraulic fracture, i.e. fracking, and soft soils. Likewise, we have another support staff of 10 others, um, postdocs, uh, looking at, again, a very wide range of expertise, institute testing, engineering geology, soil dynamics, um, through to geo-environmental engineering and geochemistry, tunnel stability, we have a, a strong group in that area, and again, also in hydraulic fracture. Okay, um, so I don't, I'm not sure what that was, but um, uh, I'm just going to... Sh a couple of programs that we've, we've uh, undertaken. One is the Ballina Soft Soil Test Facility uh, near Ballina, and the, what we've done is built uh, two embankments up there, and they've both got... One of them has got no drainage, and one of them has drainage, and we've used two different drains in this system. So these are what these drains look like. They're drilled into the ground, and what they do is accelerate the settlement of those embankments so you can build the infrastructure more quickly and more cheaply. And we've got two types. We've got the standard type shown there and also these new biodegradable ones which we're, we're testing. Now, these soft estuarine clays that uh, dot the east coast of Australia are extremely difficult to build on and embankments for road infrastructure can fail two different ways. You can get a type of slip failure where the like a slope failure on the side of the embankment, or you can get what's called a serviceability failure where the deformations are simply too large to be serviceable. Both types of failure are, are, are not very um, desirable. We've got state-of-the-art instrumentation to measure all sorts of things, and we're having a, uh, an international prediction symposium in September where we invited people from all over the world, uh, the US, uh, the UK and Europe, uh, and Asia to make Class A predictions of how these things are going to behave. We've got some of the top groups in the world, and the idea is that we're going to try and advance the science associated with modelling the behaviour of these things so that uh, we can build them more cheaply and more reliably. Uh, we're comparing lots of different test methods, and we're also developing new soft soil models. Uh, there's a, a graphic of the test site. Um, as you can see up near Ballino, as you can see, we've got about 10 to 12 metres of soft clay, typically a sand underneath it, and then at deeper levels, typically around 20 metres, you have stiffer clays. So they occur a lot on the east coast of Australia, and particularly in New South Wales. Another project that we got involved in uh, was with um, RMS and the Hunter Expressway Alliance, and this was because when they constructed one of the road embankments, or quite a few of them, they use clay stones in the construction. Well, what's the problem with that uh, and why do they do it? Well, first of all, all they want to balance the cut and fill to minimise the costs. Otherwise, you have to get rid of, of the cut somewhere. Um, but the problem is that these things swell when, when you change the moisture content. So reliable embankment design needs data on that. And we've instrumented uh, one of those embankments and we're uh, continuing to provide valuable data which is going to be used in future projects in the Sydney Basin where uh, uh, clay stones are used. These are not likely to fail in the classical sense, but again, you can have serviceability issues if you don't um, get it right. This is an interesting case that I was involved in. This is modelling pipelines on a seabed where you get the pipeline going backwards and forwards in a swiping motion due to the actions of currents uh, on the bottom. Very difficult to model. Why? Because you've got very large deformations. You can see that. This is our model over here. Uh, you've got highly nonlinear material response 
um, and this material may change, it may liquefy, so it may stop behaving like a soil and start behaving like a liquid. And you've somehow got to model these contact interfaces. You can see that they change depending where you are in this, in this process. Uh, we've developed uh, sophisticated computer uh, codes, bespoke ones that have been developed in the centre to do this, and we're benchmarking these types of predictions here with the predictions that we get in the centrifuge in order to get confidence in the numerical models that we've developed. OK, well, that's uh, a brief overview of the centre. Um, part two, I'm going to very, cover very briefly a method um, that I uh, initiated in, in um, the late 80s, uh, and it's to do with the failure of geostructures. And these, in order to predict the failure of geostructures, engineers use a method called geotechnical stability analysis. And what does that do? It predicts the maximum load capacity of a geostructure. Once you have that maximum load, you apply a safety factor to it or the strength parameters in order to get an allowable load. Now, the allowable load is what's used by engineers in design and they also use the allowable load to predict the deformations or settlement during the service life of, of the structure that you're looking at. Common causes of geotechnical failure, four main ones, all very important. Inadequate site characterisation, people are always trying to cut corners by minimising the site investigation costs. Poor construction practice, uh, vigilant supervision is required. Activity after construction, for example, if you build a structure and then excavate nearby, that changes the problem that you've designed for and can cause issues. And last, the thing I'm going to talk about, in incorrect or improved method of analysis. Why is it important? Well, cost pressures, uh, making our infrastructure dollar go further, are driving the use of ever, ever lower safety factors. Uh, the social and economic costs of failure can be absolutely enormous, uh, and not to say the legal liabilities associated with failure are high and increasing. And major failures uh, continue to occur. I showed a few of them there before, and there are plenty others out there, so geotechnical engineers uh, need to do better. Well, this new approach that was developed at the University of Newcastle um, is based on the upper and lower bound theorems of classical plasticity theory, finite elements and optimisation theory. I'm not going to go into the details, but the key thing to note is that these methods give both a safe estimate and an unsafe estimate on the failure load. Uh, so you have an inbuilt error indicator in your analysis of how good your solution is. Uh, the exact error estimate uh, or an exact error estimate can uh, be determined for each element in the finite element mesh, and you'll see one of those meshes in a minute. That allows us to refine the mesh so that we get a very small bounds gap and we get the exact collapse load uh, very accurately, very quickly. No prior assumptions are needed about the failure surface. It's based on finite elements, so it can handle very, very general problems. You can model heterogeneous materials, so they're materials that have got different properties at different locations, uh, and you can also model, model anisotropic behaviour where you've got different uh, properties in different directions. The methods are naturally discontinuous, so you can model fissured or jointed materials and interfaces. OK, this is one of the equations in the... One of the two equations, I believe, in the, in the, in the uh, presentation that's actually important. This was solved by uh, Ted Davis and John Booker at the University of Sydney in 1973. This is a long strip footing sitting on a bed of, of saturated clay. It's got a shear strength at the surface, SU0, which you can measure either in situ or in the laboratory, and that strength has a gradient equal to rho, so it's a linear strength increase with depth. And what we need to know is what is the failure load of this footing um, of width B, and you can have two different types of interface there. You can have a rough footing or a smooth footing. Now, you can show that the failure load normalised with respect to this quantity B is some factor times the terms in this square bracket. Now, we know all these terms. They're all material properties. What we need to do is determine that factor F, and this is for the short-term stability, the immediate collapse, the potential for immediate collapse. So here are some uh, results. Uh, these, the solid lines are um, the results of uh, Davis and Booker. This axis here gives the factor F for both the rough and the smooth case. And this axis along here is a, a dimensionless quantity, rho B and SU0, and it flips over halfway along. Now, this part of the axis corresponds to the case where you've got a uniform strength with depth. 
this part of the axis corresponds to the case where you've got zero shear strength at the ground surface, but the strength is still increasing. When we did this, you can see that the upper and lower bounds, uh, indicated by the red and green symbols, are very close. So we're very happy with that. We're, we're a bit alarmed that we didn't get the same results as Davis and Booker because this was supposed to be the exact solution and has been very widely used in industry. Well, it turns out that that solution is not correct. Uh, we uh, collaborated with Chris Martin at Oxford who has a more refined uh, method of characteristics program which does adaptive meshing and he got these results here and we since showed that those results are exact and they agree very well with our upper and lower bounds. So let's have a look at how one of these analysis uh, takes place in practice. This is a specific case for that material property there. We're looking at half our footing. And what we're going to do is just start off, we guess any mesh. And in this case, we start off with 100 elements. You can see the upper and lower browns are pretty awful. So this is for the rough case. We've got a 77% difference between the upper bound estimate of that factor F and the lower bound. However, when we start doing that automatic meshing, because we can calculate the contribution of each element to that bounds gap, we can refine the element mesh automatically and after about three iterations, we've nailed um, that exact collapse load to within a couple of percent. 2,000 elements, uh, so we don't get much more improvement as we continue to iterate. If we want to get even smaller difference between these, we just use more elements. Total solution time for something like that is less than a minute uh, on a laptop. The sort of information that you can get out of these things, which is very useful for engineers, uh, these show the failure mechanisms. And what we've got here is called the plastic power dissipation. So this is the rate of energy dissipation that due to plastic failure that you get when this thing is collapsing. Now this case over here is where we've got a very small, almost zero um, strength at the ground surface. So what happens, that footing fails by the soil squeezing out from the side of it. Whereas this case over here, which is a more typical property, you get a much more deep-seated failure mechanism. So very useful for engineers to be able to get this, this uh, visual picture of how the things are failing. The second case, um, this was prompted by a lot of tunnelling operations going around the world and I was a, a initially um, uh, triggered to uh, look at this by people at Imperial College who were involved in designing the London Underground many years ago and, it's, and this work has uh, been used again since then. And what we have is our circular tunnel and at the ground we have a typically have a ground stress that might be due to buildings. Uh, the cover for the tunnel, that's the distance is C, uh, the diameter D. Now typically with a tunnel boring machine as it advances you put in the lining behind the tunnel boring machine but you have this unsupported heading length P and what tunnelling engineers need to know is what sort of pressure you need to stop this heading collapsing before you can get the lining in. Very common problem and you've probably heard of, of tunnel heading failures. Again, we're looking at, at, at an undrained clay, so this is uh, with the same properties as we had for our footing. We've also got solutions for things like rock uh, and cohesive frictional materials. Now it turns out if this heading length P is fairly large compared to D, you can treat this as a two-dimensional problem. And the second major equation um, is that by looking at the work done on this thing as it collapses, you can show that the stability of this whole system, remembering we want, to, we want to work out what sigma T is, is simply the difference between this surface stress, the tunnel stress, normal, <coughs> normalised with respect to the shear strength at the ground surface, <coughs> and it's a function of these dimensionless quantities here. Now, these are just a, a that's just a dimensionless um, weight property which is related to the unit weight, which is equal to the density times gravity, and this is just that dimensionless strength increase property. So we know all of these. What we want you to know is what is the numeric value of this thing on the right-hand side so we can calculate sigma t. Well, you can go and develop a whole host of stability charts using these methods, and we've done this, and these are results from a, a PhD student of mine. This is just for one particular case of C, C on D equal to 4. We've done a lot of different more shallow tunnels and deeper tunnels and uh, tunnelling engineers can use these. The upper and lower bounds, as you can see, 
very close together. So we've pretty much got the exact solution. Believe it or not, hugely common problem, but no exact solution out there for engineers to use. Uh, so these uh, tunnel stability charts are very, very useful. Let's have a look how you would use this. So this line along the bottom here, so these are just lines for different strength profiles with depth. This case here is for a uniform strength. So let's have a look if we had a, a dimensionless weight pro, uh, parameter of two and we had a uniform strength, we would go up there to hit that line, go across there. We then see that this stability number is equal to roughly minus five. We know sigma s. We know that undrained shear strength at the surface so we can get the tunnel pressure that's needed to prevent collapse. So uh, geotechnical engineers don't go, have to go through the whole process of analysing these problems over and over again. They can use these sorts of charts. There's a typical failure. Um, uh, failure mesh for 4,000 elements. As you can see, the elements are concentrated exactly where you would expect to get failure. And again, we can look at these power dissipation plots or, or rate of energy dissipation at collapse. Increasing strength with depth, very narrow failure mechanism. Doesn't go below the tunnel floor because it wants to avoid failing in the strong material. Whereas if you have a uniform strength case, you have a much wider failure mechanism and a much deeper failure mechanism, which uh, obviously has implications if you've got infrastructure uh, near that particular tunnelling operation. We can compare our results from our upper and lower bound calculations using the uh, centrifuge results of Robert Mayer, uh, developed at uh, Cambridge in 1979. Um, again, the upper and lower bounds are very close together. This is for a specific case where we have a weight parameter equal to 2.6, and that's stability number. We've plotted it a slightly different way that uh, we've plotted it on C on D on X axis. Uh, as you can see, we've got very good agreement between our upper and lower bound uh, predictions and the experimental data, and there are lots of other results that we can compare with, and that gives us a lot of confidence in using those techniques in practice. So that method's a very powerful new tool for predicting low capacity of geostructures. It's been applied to a very wide range of problems, uh, such as some of the ones that Mary's already uh, mentioned. We can model very complex um, uh, problems, complex behaviour, the bounds gap, that we mentioned can uh, gives error engineers an inbuilt error indicator and you can use it to get a mesh adapt adaptation procedure to give accurate solutions very quickly. And we only need the strength parameters to do the stability analysis, which is very uh, useful uh, for engineers because that's the property that they need to know the best. Okay, the third part, um, which contains some, some videos uh, of work that we've done. Uh, this was uh, instigated by one of my colleagues, uh, Dr Anna Giacomini, uh, and it ended up involving quite a few people uh, in the group, and I got involved in it on the modelling side, and it's looking at modelling rockfall. And this is what rockfall is, it's and there's the impact on some uh, road and rail infrastructure the middle of Newcastle, Lawrence Hargrave Drive up near Newcastle, the Sydney Newcastle Rail Link, and also on mining infrastructure in the Hunter Valley and also in the Savage River Mine. Obviously, it can be very destructive uh, and also very dangerous and also e uh, extremely disruptive. So one of the first things that uh, we did was one of my colleagues, Stephen Fitches, with an army of PhD students and, and project students, looked at all the geological formations um, uh, in New South Wales. He's one of the few people I know that collects rocks for a hobby and then correlated all of these uh, uh, areas with the different type of rockfall that they observed and you get different shapes, you get different sizes depending on the geological form, uh, formation that you have and he came up with these frequency charts. So designers in ro of road and rail infrastructure and also mining infrastructure can go and look at that and get an idea of what is the typical size of rockfall that you can expect. It's not the be all and end all, but it gives you a very good place to start uh, and very, very useful in practice and has been widely used. The other testing that we did, um, we found that a lot of rockfall fencing um, in use in Australia was very expensive and mostly because it was designed for European or North American applications where the mountains are bigger and the rockfall events are much larger than ours. So we started doing uh, some testing on uh, different rockfall barriers. So this is a typical system here. You have these posts, you have these uh, uh, pretension tendons, and then you have this chain link mesh. 
and that's uh, a passive barrier. And this is a block that was uh, tested in the lab at Newcastle. As you can see, these things generate quite a lot of energy. And um, the key things were, how do we design the connections? What is the best mesh to use? And what sort of uh, post spacings do we need? And the reason that that's important is that these rock fall barriers can cover fairly long distances. So you want to get it um, uh, the best design that you can to get the most cost effective solution. We also did some testing um, up around Mount Sugarloaf near Newcastle, where we went out and did some tests with uh, a range of uh, block sizes on different slopes. And one of those tests typically looks like this occupational health and safety nightmare, getting all these tests done through the university. And the back analysis using high-speed cameras enabled us to calculate these restitution coefficients. Now, what's a restitution coefficient? It's simply when the rock hits the ground, it's the ratio of the velocity out to the velocity in. Now, normally you would expect those restitution coefficients to be less than one because you get some damping due to the ground effect, OK? Um, and all most, or, or most of the common rockfall software that we tried to use assumed that behaviour. However, when we did the tests, we found that the restitution coefficients, you have two of them, one parallel to the slope and one normal to the slope. So this is the one parallel on this axis here. This is the one normal to the slope. We can see that the one tangential to the slope or parallel to the slope was less than one, so that was all good. But the, the normal restitution coefficients were actually quite uh, much larger. In fact, we got values up to around two. So that meant we had to write all of our own software from scratch. And why is that so? It's simply because when a, a block or a rockfall goes down a slope, it can transfer its rotational kinetic energy into a translational one. And people who aficionados of AFL or rugby will know this, that you, get, you can have a ball bouncing end over end and all of a sudden it bounces up into the air, exactly the same effect that we're getting here. And that needs to be taken into account when you do the modelling. So following on from this, um, uh, Anna and, and uh, some of her colleagues and me, with me involved uh, got some uh, uh, funding out of the mining industry through ACARP to look at the behaviour of rockfall on high walls. So this is a mine up near the Hunter Valley. Now, what I'm going to talk about is just for mining applications, but this is clearly applicable uh, to road and rail cuttings, and we're in fact talking with RMS about applying all of this work to the, the problems that they have, and it is very, very applicable. So here's a, a, an in-situ test. We've got our block up here. We've got this, what's called drapery. That's just a wire mesh that is designed to restrain the trajectory and velocity of this block. This is, uh, I knew that would happen. This is um, in real time. So the drapery is there to try and constrain the effect of those falling blocks. And this one over here is the same test, but in slow motion, just looking at the bottom. You can see that the kinetic energy of these things and the damage that they can do is quite substantial. You need to control the velocity and also you need to predict this run out distance at the bottom. How far do those blocks move when they fall down the slope? Well, in order to build our models, the first thing we needed to do is somehow get a three dimensional picture of the slope and or the cutting in this case or the high wall. And to do that, uh, we had a purpose uh, built drone constructed. Uh, it's got uh, six props on it and it's got these mantis arms at the front. Uh, those mantis arms are that shape so that we can get good vision with our camera and our laser module. So we can go along the slope, do lots and lots of scans. We get all of these images and then we stitch them together to get a three-dimensional model. And just to show what they look like, this is a scan of that slope that you saw in that very first uh, rockfall video totally constructed using drone technology and stitching together these images using what's called structure uh, from motion software. And we've actually modified this quite a bit as well. So what you can see is you can get very detailed images of these rock faces. So you can look for unstable sections, you can look for uh, potential fractures. Obviously, 
very important uh, in road and rail infrastructure, just not mining infrastructure. And you can look at things that you can't get from a normal survey. So the process is for our high wall here, this is the portal in a mine, so this is where the trucks go in and out of to ext uh, extract the coal. You've got this, this netting, uh, the drapery over it to stop the rockfall impacting on the portal and obviously hitting the trucks. We created our digitised image using the drone technology. We then use that to develop a computational model. So this is the computational model for the rock face based on the digitised image. And this here is a discrete element model of the actual mesh. So we modelled every single strand in the mesh, three dimensions. And what we're going to do is show you how we can simulate this rockfall process using real data and calibrating the, the, the real properties of that mesh and feeding it into a model. So here's our model. And this trajectory is uh, where the rock block will go. We're looking at the top, the side, and the front. And as you can see, this is a block. As you, we let it go, this is in slow motion. You can see that the block goes down the slope, is constrained by uh, the uh, drapery both its velocity and its trajectory, and you can see the sort of deformations that you can get when it hits an outcrop. And when it hits the bottom, you can also predict the run-out distance. So that's also a very important thing that you need to know. So engineers need to know what's the maximum velocity, what's the velocity at the bottom near that portal, because that's where the trucks were going in and out, um, and how far are these blocks going to run out. And we had those experimental results for, for a whole bunch of tests, and you can see that our numerical predictions are quite good. And so they should be because we calibrated, we've got an exact model for the rock face, we obtained the restitution coefficients by um, doing those field tests, and we also tested the, the mesh in the lab to get its material properties. So the key thing there is that um, from that research, uh, the geological environments in New South Wales have been categorised so that we can classify rockfall hazard. Uh, we have a better understanding of rockfall in New South Wales and we've presented that in a form that is of direct use to asset managers and engineers. And extensive testing of rockfall protection systems, both passive and active, uh, most of the ones I've shown there, um, you can get two types of rockfall barriers, have led to more cost-effective designs, especially for uh, low energy rockfall regions and most of that work was triggered uh, in collaboration. It started with the RTA it was, as, as, as it was known then and uh, shows just what can happen when you get collaboration between uh, government bodies and research institutions. And um, Anna has taken this a step further. She's got a, a, a new phone app uh, for general use by mine engineers and also anybody who's interested in rockfall, that that gives a qualitative assessment of the rockfall hazard and it tells you where you need to do more quantitative analysis. So it, it, it alerts you to uh, potential uh, dangerous situations. So clearly, um, energy and transport infrastructure design poses a lot of very difficult challenges. Uh, I truly admire the work that gets done on the Pacific Highway. Those guys do an amazing job. It's incredibly difficult material to build on. Any of you who go up there, you find that you can't even walk on it and yet we have to build embankments many metres high. Uh, geotechnical engineering aspects are often a large part of our total infrastructure costs, especially for construction on marginal land. So we've got to uh, always strive to do it uh, better and more cheaply. And research and engineering science has clearly uh, led to more uh, cost-effective design approaches for lots of aspects of Australia's energy and transport infrastructure, whether it be offshore foundations, rockfall barrier systems, tunnels, footing design, etc. And the key thing that often gets missed uh, in the discussion of engineering research is even small percentage savings can result in huge savings in absolute terms, simply because of the dollars we're expending. So when you're spending $250 billion, 10% saving is a lot of money. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's serious dollars and it can certainly make your infrastructure dollars go further. So uh, lots of colleagues I'd like to thank, both at Newcastle and also internationally in the UK, China and the USA. Also um, 
various organisations, government organisations, the uh, ARC and Mary's office has been a strong supporter of our centres, uh, our centre, roads and maritime services and a whole host of uh, important industry partners that have uh, helped us get this research done. For those of you who want to look at all the sorts of things we do, you can check out our internal reports. You can download those um, from that site there. They give very detailed descriptions of the projects that we're doing and what the outcomes are. So uh, very good if you're uh, suffering from um, uh, insomnia. OK, that's it. And we've, we've got time for a couple of questions. Any questions? No, the gobsmack. Yes. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, Well, a, a, pass, a, passive, a passive barrier is where you let the, where you let the rock fall uh, start and then you try and stop it. And an, act, uh, and an active uh, barrier is where you actually, you may put mesh over the rock fall so it can't even move. So you often see that in alpine areas where you see all this mesh uh, anchored, into, anchored into the slope so the rock fall can't occur. That's preferable, but it's also extremely expensive. You can imagine doing that everywhere. So that's the difference between active and passive. Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, first of all, wanted to thank, uh, thank you for the great uh, presentation and Dr. O'Kane for the, for the setup. I was amused to note that it was described in the literature as groundbreaking research. And I, <laughs> and I believe that that brings new meaning to the uh, new meaning to the phrase. Uh, I did have one serious question, which was um, on your rockfall uh, analysis modeling. Uh, very interesting, very deep. Is uh, just one question: Is it deterministic, or does it model chaotic elements as well? So the repeated tests would give you a distribution. Yeah, we we are. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the initial ones were deterministic, but we're now working on to getting uh, stochastic models, uh, particularly for the, the uh, face of the, the high wall or the face of the slope, and that's a very good point. And what we want to do is be able to get a distribution. That's probably our, our main goal, but we had to start somewhere um, because there was no software to do the sort of things that we were, we were trying to do. Um, challenging problem because all that stuff's in 3D. So you're modelling each link of, of, the, of the mesh um, and you've got a non-linear model for the, the wire behaviour. Uh, and we discovered a couple of things that the um, manufacturers, there are two big ones, Macaferi and Geobrug. Macaferi is Italian and Geobrug Swiss. They had to go back and redesign re um, their meshes because they didn't handle a thing called the bullet effect, which we particularly get in Australia, where we get smaller uh, rock particles. But these are very high velocity, so they could actually go through the mesh and cause serious damage. And so they've had to go back and, and redesign their, their, uh, their actual grids for use in Australia, particularly in the mining area. with structural materials for nuclear and aircraft applications. Right. I realise you've got a bloody difficult problem because you don't know what the material is. Yes. Right? And I look at what we were doing, and you're about where we, when we were dealing with nuclear and, and aerospace maybe 10 years ago. We were using 2D analyses. We were using simple linear hardening. And, we, and material, constitutive material constitutive properties were our biggest problem. Where do you go next? Because we, we had to go from there driven by regulators to actually know more about the specific material properties with depth and things like that. Can you go there? Because that's the obvious oh, next step. Oh, certainly. I'm, uh, absolutely. Um, our soft soil models are extremely non-linear. Uh, I didn't cover any of that yeah. today because I, it, I think it just gets too technical. Um, but they're all highly non-linear and very complicated. The rockfall uh, analysis isn't linear. Um, the uh, model that we use for the wire mesh is non-linear. It's piecewise linear but we use piecewise linear and, and the model that we use is based on experimental data. Um, no, we're, we're right up there in, in terms of non-linearity. Uh, I, I do understand the difference. I can yeah. measure the material I want yeah. many times before I put it into service. Yours is different everywhere. The problem that we have in geotechnical engineering is we have to walk a fine line. Um, 
uh, that geotechnical engineers um, have a lot of trouble measuring properties. So you can come out with extremely complex models that no one can ever use because they can't measure the properties. <laughs> Right. Um, so what you have to do is get a balance between something that can be used in practice and something uh, that is as accurate as you can make it. So uh, that's, the, that's the line we walk. Uh, but we certainly do some of the more extreme end where we have lots of parameters which are, which are difficult to measure. And we have, the, we have the skill and the laboratory apparatus to measure them so we can get accurate predictions. But that's for another talk. Congratulations on a wonderful talk. Uh, you said at the start, one of the problems geotechs have is that you have to deal with the materials as they are. I just wonder if anybody's working on the infiltration of chemicals to actually change the properties. I'm thinking of soils in particular, but it sounds a wonderful opportunity for the chemical industry. No, very much so. Um, we have all sorts of uh, ground improvement strategies. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of work going on um, in uh, the biological space. Can you use biological agents to in, in, in improve uh, ground behaviour? The big problem we have with using chemicals is that if you've got groundwater anywhere near it, particularly in Australia, uh, you've got to be very, very careful that what you're, what you're using doesn't cause a problem, and we know all about groundwater problems. Um, so <laughs> uh, that's, that's the issue, but the biological uh, agents, uh, which is something I'm not an expert on, that's something that, that is definitely a growth area. We try and mechanically uh, enhance uh, properties. That's what those drains do. They basically turn the clay, instead of being a very slow draining material, which means the deformations take a long time to reach their final values, they get there much more quickly. So that's a mechanical uh, enhancement of ground improvement. Um, but the, the, the problem you have with chemicals is also how do you get them in there? <laughs> and you might have to get them to great depths because if you've got large infrastructure, then the, the ground area that's affected can be quite deep. Right. Well, we might finish there. I have to say that last question was almost an in-joke. Um, straight after this talk, because there's so much expertise in the room, we're holding a meeting on Williamtown, um, and Scott and Chris have both been dragooned into talking about the whole issue of the remediation and the containment of the PFOS problem at Williamtown. So, um, you know, these talks aren't just nice discussions of what goes on in the state. Um, we make heavy use of these people. You heard he works for RMS. He does a lot of work for everyone else. And, Scott, thank you not only for a wonderful talk, but for everything you do for New South Wales. And here's a little token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.